Today we're going to hear the remarkable story of Dr. Fred Manasseh. He is a Holocaust survivor and one of the children saved by the Kinder Transport. Fred was born in Frankfurt, Germany in 1935. He was hidden in France during most of the war with his brother Gus, but lost his father, mother, and sister in the Holocaust. Fred came to America as a non-English speaking nine-year-old in early 1945, yet managed to graduate from City College in New York. He worked as an electrical engineer at Bell Labs, and after receiving his PhD in physics, served as a professor of electrical engineering and as a consultant to the defense electronics industry. In 1976, Fred started his own solar energy company, which he ran for 10 years before returning to work in the defense electronics industry. After retiring in 2002, Fred started to sculpt. He has exhibited his sculpture a number of times and recently organized an exhibition of art by Holocaust survivors at the Hebrew College. His newest works are related to his early experiences in Nazi Europe and one of his pieces won several prizes. Fred, would you please refresh our memory by briefly relating the events going on in Germany before 1938? Well, Hitler took power in 1933. And as soon as he took power, there were uh, a number of demonstrations, including the burning of books uh, in Berlin. And uh, the burning of the books was, for the most part, just the beginning of the uh, period before the war started in 1939, in which Jews were increasingly taken, basically, and reduced from citizens of Germany with professional status into a group of people who were essentially below servant class people. The professors were fired from their jobs in universities, physicians were terminated from hospitals, and there were a number of demonstrations, the first of which was the burning of books, and then there were the F Nuremberg Laws enacted in 1935 and these laws basically identified who a Jew was by facial characteristics, by um, the kinds of professions they would be involved with, and they began the systematic elimination of Jewish people, citizenship as Germans, and the rights as Germans, and they were treated as a separate class. Um, this was really done to the, with the outside world, not really concerned in any uh, serious way. In 1938, Kristallnacht was a really the beginning of the, uh, the main component of showing the world what was going on in Germany. And in the New York Times, um, in a banner of that day, it talked about it. But that was very unusual. Most of the things that were going on in Germany were just not considered to be important enough in the rest of the world, and so nothing was done about it. What was your family like life uh, before Kristallnacht in November 1938? Well, in, 19, uh, in the early 30s, my brother was born in 1931. We were a middle-class family. Uh, my father owned a shoe factory in a nearby town. Uh, we were upper middle class. We lived in a lovely apartment in the Jewish section of Frankfurt on Main. Um, we had a governess, uh, and I have pictures of that particular time of my brother at the sea, at the beach. My grandparents owned a hotel in Baden-Baden, and so because of that, we, we summered in Baden-Baden, which was cool because it was in the, in, in the mountains. It was near the green, uh, the uh, Black Forest. Uh, and I don't remember much about that time because I was, you know, two or three years old. But it was a very pleasant life. After, after 1935, when I was born, obviously, I experienced uh, some of the prejudices that I've described before. But because I was a child and I had an older brother 
and a younger sister, I really wasn't worried about things. For our daily life didn't change much. We still took vacations. We still um, had our home was relatively undisturbed. We could still afford to do most anything that we wanted to. But on Kristallnacht, the burning of the synagogue happened in Frankfurt as well as in Berlin. And my brother actually was at the, um, the burning of the largest synagogue in Frankfurt, which my father was very involved with. So uh, things changed uh, for us during that period until Kristallnacht. But after Kristallnacht, everything changed. My father at that point knew we had, to, we had to all leave Germany, as his brother had done in 1936 when it was possible to come to the United States. So what he uh, also, starting after Kristallnacht, the German government, as well as the Austrian uh, government, which was obviously part of Germany at that point, and the Czechoslovakian government all authorized a total of 20,000 children to leave uh, if they could um, uh, be ransomed by the family. And so there was a thing called the kinder transport. And my father arranged to put us on the kinder transport while he booked passage on the St. Louis which was a ship that left Hamburg to go to Cuba, which is one of the few places where you could get a visa at that time. Uh, so we were, we were put on the train, and he went off, leaving my mother, my sister, and my grandmother, his, uh, my father's mother, in Frankfurt. Now, what about the adults? What did, did Hitler... I mean, you had said that Hitler had ransomed the children. That's why right. didn't he have an opportunity to do, why didn't he make an opportunity to ransom the adults just to get rid of the Jewish population? I think basically he was focused on his next step, which was to invade Poland. He had plans basically to start the war around that time. And I think he needed labor and the Jews that he had under his control would be able to work in the factories. They couldn't be professionals anymore. They couldn't own land anymore. Therefore, you know, they would have to work for the state. Uh, so that was one of the reasons. So uh, only those who could get visas to get out of Germany, you had to pay a ransom because you could only get 100 marks out and no, no property in Germany to come back to. So if my father wanted to uh, leave, he would have had to basically give up the factory, um, uh, unless he had made arrangements to leave some people still there who were also directors of the company, and that was my, my mother and grandmother were part of that. Uh, but he was denied entrance, as everyone knows, uh, when he came to Cuba for reasons which had to do with the fact that the new regime had wanted to raise the money. The ship came off the, state, off the coast of, of uh, Florida, Miami, and he appealed to his brother and the rest of the Jews, along with him, appealed to the State Department for exile, asylum, basically. And it was denied by the State Department, which was intent on keeping the country from getting involved with the European war. Uh, the war hadn't started yet, but everybody knew that it was going to be. So. Uh, Adults were just not allowed to leave unless they had a place to go and unless they had enough money to get an exit visa from Germany. Okay. Now, you had said that you and your brother had gone to uh, Belgium. Just how long uh, did you uh, and Gus uh, stay in Brussels? Well, w again, um, we were in Belgium from sometime in, in early spring of 19... Uh, 39 until 1940, May 10th, when the Germans, having finished Poland, attacked uh, Belgium and went around the Maginot Line in France to get into France. And the night that uh, we were in an orphanage, and somehow or other my father who had come back to Brussels because he had been f intelligent enough 
to get a visa to Belgium, uh, which was a neutral country, 